To get started, we would like to acknowledge the land that the Ohio State University occupies is the ancestral and contemporary territory of the Shawnee, Potawatomi, Delaware, Miami, Peoria, Seneca, Wyandotte, Ojibwe, and Cherokee people. Specifically, the university resides on land ceded in the 1795 Treaty of Greeneville and the forced removal of tribes through the Indian Removal Act of 1830. We want to honor the resiliency of these tribal nations and recognize the historical context that has and continues to affect indigenous peoples of this land. Westfest is the Ohio State University Annual Science and Sustainability Festival. This program is made possible through a grant from the Ohio State Energy Partner. I'm Monica and I'll be behind the scenes making sure everything goes smoothly. If you share about Westfest on social media, please use the hashtag, hashtag OSUWestfest. We have a few short announcements to share before the program starts to ensure that all attendees have the best experience possible. Automatic captions have been enabled for this session. You have the ability to enable or disable the captions to suit your needs. We hope to make this meeting as interactive as possible, and we definitely want to hear from you. So please feel free to add your comments or questions in the chat. We will be monitoring that um, throughout today's program. Even if we don't answer right away, please know that we are seeing your questions and we will get back to you as soon as we can. If you receive one of Wester's activity kits, you have everything you need to follow along with Courtney and Kate at home. Make sure you have the activity bag labeled planting for pollinators. Don't worry if you don't have an activity kit, you can still follow along with today's program. A digital activity booklet with supply list and instructions for all our virtual programs is available on our website, go.osu.edu slash Wester. You are attending Planting for Pollinators presented by Kearney at the Sustainability Institute and Kate Kaper. Um, if you have any technical difficulties or have any questions about how the program is working um, throughout the, the, the program, please feel free to, to type those on the chat as well and I'll try to help you behind the scenes. Uh, I am now going to turn it over to Kate to get the program started. Thank you so much, Monica. Hello, everyone. I'm Cade. I'm an environmental science major at Ohio State, and I'll be uh, talking to you guys a little bit about some of the research that I've been doing on pollinators and what you guys can do uh, yourselves to help pollinators. Uh, Courtney, do you want to uh, go ahead with um, the supplies that we'll need? Sure. Um... Hello, everybody. So as Monica mentioned, you have all the supplies that you need if you have one of our West Fest kits at home, but please don't worry if you don't have it. Everything that we're going to use today is stuff that you can easily buy um, at stores. Um, so as you can see in the picture, we are going to have, um, we have some seeds, we have a square fabric, we have a container of soil, the the ball that you see in the picture is actually potter's clay and then a uh, piece of string with a label on it. So we will talk about these materials and we'll go through the hands-on activity after we have a chance to learn a little bit more about pollinators from Cade. Um, so that I'm going to turn it back over to Cade. Actually, you know what, Cade, why don't I go ahead and do the polls oh, yeah. before I turn it back over. So we wanted to get a little bit of an understanding about what you all know about pollinators before we start telling you about it. What we wanna know from you, the audience, is what is a pollinator? So take a look there, there's four options. So I'll give you a few moments to make that choice while I try to keep my cat from walking on my computer. All right, awesome. I'm looking here and it looks like everybody got the answer correct. So a pollinator, is an animal or insect that carries pollen from plant to plant. And we'll learn a little bit more from Cade later as to why that is so important. All right, great job, everyone. We have one more poll for you. Let's go ahead and move to the next slide and launch that poll. So we asked you, what is a pollinator? And now we wanna know who is a pollinator. So looking at the poll, as soon as it comes up, go ahead and make your selection on which of these you think is a pollinator. Okay, I see that we just published the results and 
again, everyone did an amazing job at who is a pollinator. It's all of the above. So let me close this down and let's show the pictures on the slide. So as you said in your poll results, all of those animals and insects that we listed are pollinators, butterflies, bees, hummingbirds, and bats. There are others as well, but these are some really interesting and popular ones. The next question I have for you, we're not gonna do a poll, we're just gonna respond in the chat. So uh, what we wanna know from you is why you think pollinators are important. So we'll give you a couple of minutes. Whenever you get your answer typed in, go ahead and hit enter. I'll watch the chat to see that folks have had time to respond. So why are pollinators important? Okay, well, I'll tell you what, while people are thinking and entering their answer, I'm gonna go ahead and pass things over to Cade and give him a chance to introduce himself and then he can answer this question with you. So let me take myself off screen and see, there you go, Cade, take it away. Awesome, thanks so much, Courtney. So hi everyone, again, I'm Cade Kaffer. Uh, I am an environmental science major here at Ohio State University. Um, I started working in a research lab my sophomore year um, that was doing research on bioretention cells, which is just a fancy word for a rain garden. And a rain garden is a specially designed type of garden um, with plants that will uh, hold water um, to try to reduce the amount of water that flows um, onto our streets and everything and into the sewers. Um, so I started wondering, I'm, I love butterflies. They're like my favorite thing ever. And I wanted to do a research project on monarch butterflies. And I started wondering, well, hey, I wonder if we can turn uh, these rain gardens into some pollinator gardens as well to support monarch populations. So I'll talk a little bit about that in just a second here. Do we want to uh, open the chat and read the answers, Courtney? Yeah, I have my chat open. I don't know if you're able to do that on your screen, but we have some great answers, Cade. So we have one answer from Alyssa, um, which is to have fruit. Krista said, honey is one thing that is a result from pollinators. And then Miles said that pollinators carry pollen from plant to plant so that plants that don't have, so that a plant that doesn't have pollen can get pollen from another one. So I think those are great responses. Awesome. Yeah, I agree. Those are really, really great responses and they're all correct. So we have, let's see, please let me, there we go. Sorry about that. Um, so pollinators are super important. Somebody mentioned fruit production and that is exactly right. And a lot of other food too um, comes from pollinators. In fact, uh, pollinators are responsible for one in every three bites of food we eat. So that is a lot of food. Um, they're also, they help plants reproduce. I saw somebody say that uh, they carry pollen from plant to plant, and that's exactly right. That's how plants reproduce. Um, the, the pollinator will go into the flower for nectar um, to drink its nectar, and then it'll knock pollen onto its legs. And then when it goes to a different flower, it'll carry that pollen from the first flower over to the new flower, and then that's how the plants can reproduce. And they can also drive wildflower diversity. So different flowers will have different um, morphologies, which is just a fancy word for their shape. Um, for example, uh, some flowers have really long uh, tubular shapes, um, and that's so that hummingbirds can get their proboscis or tongue uh, all the way down into the flower where the nectar is. Now, pollinators are facing uh, some challenges, and monarch butterflies especially. So monarchs only lay their eggs on milkweed. Um, there are 16 species of milkweed native to Ohio, uh, and this is the only source of food for their caterpillars. They can't eat anything else. So this is a little milkweed plant, and you can see um, really tiny there. It's kind of hard to see, but right um, below and to the right of my thumb there is a little uh, monarch caterpillar. So that's a very small one. Uh, and this caterpillar will eat and eat and eat and eat until it grows into this big caterpillar here. This is almost two inches long. And these are two that I found during my research project um, on another type of milkweed. Now, the challenge facing monarchs is 
that we're taking away the monarch's milkweed to grow our own food. So often milkweed will grow in places that we use for agriculture. Um, and so we just take out all the milkweeds that we can grow things like corn and soybeans, which is really important because we need food too, but so do the monarchs. So this is uh, one of my research sites. This is Waterman Farm right here at Ohio State on West Campus. And on the right of the picture, there's like a milkweed patch, but all the rest of it, that's all corn and soybeans. So there's a lot of human food, but not much monarch food. So to solve this problem, uh, to grow our own food and also keep some for the monarchs, um, I started wondering if we can provide habitat for pollinators in our own neighborhoods. So one great way to do this is a pollinator garden. That's this picture here. You can see there's a monarch butterfly on the echinacea right in the middle there. And you can see there's tons and tons of different flowers in there. And flower diversity is really important for pollinators because different pollinators like different flowers. So this is one of the uh, bioretention cells that I mentioned earlier. So again, these are uh, gardens that are designed not necessarily for pollinators, but more for stormwater. So there's a little um, inlet on the curve on the bottom of the picture there where the water flows in and then all the plants suck up that water and hold it so that it doesn't flood our streets basically. But as you can see, there's not all that many flowers in there for pollinators. So I asked, can we combine the two types of gardens and design them both for stormwater and for pollinators? So here is some milkweed that I planted in one of my gardens. Um, and I wanted to see basically, will monarchs lay their eggs here? Because that's really important. If they don't have a place to lay their eggs, they can't reproduce and then we have no more monarchs. So I planted some milkweed here, started counting every week. I would go out and count monarch eggs on these plants. And sure enough, I found some. Here's a um, one of the eggs that I found in one of my gardens. You can see the milkweed in its little pot there. And that tiny little white dot kind of in the center on that leaf, that's a monarch egg. They're really hard to see, um, but I was really glad to find one because it means that my research project is working and we can keep monarchs alive and healthy, their populations healthy uh, through milkweed in these gardens and also still have room to grow all of our food that we need as humans. So there's some other uh, pollinator conservation programs out there. Um, the first one is the Conservation Reserve Program. And this is a federal program that works with farmers and landowners to conserve pollinator habitat. So we can put milkweed not just in our gardens in our neighborhoods, but also um, like we saw on Waterman, uh, right next to the agricultural field, there's also some milkweed there to attract monarchs. There's also the Ohio Department of Transportation, that's what ODOT stands for, the Pollinator Habitat Initiative. And this manages public rights of way, so that's things like roadsides underneath power lines um, for pollinator habitat. So they don't mow or spray pesticides on those areas. They just let wildflowers grow to support pollinators. And there's also community science programs. So this is a great way for someone like you guys to get involved in pollinator science if this is something you're interested in. My favorite one is Monarch Watch. It's based out of the University of Kansas. And they do a tagging program for monarchs where they track their migration from uh, North America, Canada, and the United States all the way down to Mexico. And there's also Monarch Joint Venture, which does some similar things. And these programs are really great because since it's everyone in the community can participate, that's a ton of data, like hundreds of thousands of people can be submitting their data to these projects. And that amount of data is really uh, valuable and beneficial for science. So- Hey, Kay, do you mind if yes. I jump in real quick? We yes, had a question um, in the chat asking, does that tag that you just showed on the monarch's wing hurt the butterfly? Oh, that is a really good question. And fortunately, no, it does not hurt the monarch at all. Those tags are so incredibly light that the monarch doesn't even feel it when it's uh, flapping its wings. It just, um, it'd be kind of like maybe wearing a bracelet or something for you guys where you don't really think about it or feel it. It's just kind of 
for you, it's for decoration, but for the monarchs, it helps us track their uh, migration. So that is a really good question. Thanks uh, for bringing that up. Um, and so I wanted to also mention some things that you guys can do for pollinators um, just to help them out because everyone can help out pollinator populations. The best thing you guys can do is plant native wildflowers in your garden. And we're going to help you in doing that in just a little bit. Courtney's going to teach us how to make a seed ball, which is really fun. Um, you can avoid using herbicides like Roundup in your yard and garden or ask your parents to um, avoid using those because those aren't good for pollinators. They'll hurt them. Um, yeah, th those are, are best to try to avoid. Um, you guys can participate in community science. Um, you can uh, do ask an adult to help you do some online research about any of those programs I mentioned, or just Google like monarch citizen or monarch community science, um, and something things will come up for you. And if you're feeling particularly brave, you can write to your local legislators, um, have your grown-ups help you write a letter, and tell them to support pollinator-friendly legislation. So that is all I've got. This is, uh, I have an Instagram page for my research. If you're interested in keeping up with that, there's a QR code you can scan. And I think next, Courtney will be teaching us how to make a seed ball. All right, fabulous. If you don't mind um, advancing the slide for me, just so we can show the list of supplies again. Yeah. Of course. All right, thank you. So yes, we are going to move to the next part of our program, which is to actually make a seed ball. Um, so if you don't have these materials with you right now, just follow along, watch and learn because it'll be pretty easy, I think, for you to remember um, how to do this when you go to do it on your own. So go ahead and stop sharing the slides now, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I'm gonna try and not make this too wiggly. I have my camera phone kind of hanging from my computer screen, but the first thing we want to do, let's look at our supplies again. So this here is a ball of what we call potter's clay. So if you've ever seen a video of someone using a pottery wheel, making a cup or a vase, this is the type of pottery or of clay that they would use. So it's a natural product. Um, you don't wanna use something like if you have Sculpey or um, some of the other things that you can make out of clay and you bake it in the oven, um, those generally have plastics in it and that's not something you wanna put in your garden. So this potter's clay is really nice because it doesn't have anything synthetic, anything man-made in it. It's just a natural um, clump of clay. So mine has been sitting out this morning so it feels really cold and when it's cold, it's a little bit harder to work. So just pick up your clay and work it around in your hand to get it to be a little bit warmer. Because what we're gonna want to do is to have this be shaped into a bit of a bowl. So once you have it warm enough, you're going to, and I'm sorry that my camera is a little bit jiggly. You can see that mine looks dry on the edges. Oh yeah, so Mallory, sorry, my cat has decided, you saw that big wiggle in my camera. Cats are really fun when you're trying to teach from home because they love to get in the way. So they're jumping around on my table. Um, so Mallory said in the chat that she has tons of natural clay in their yard so that they could use that, which that's amazing. If you have a yard, if your soil composition in your yard includes a lot of clay, um, then just grab that, that would be great. And if you get to clay and it seems a little dry and brittle, mine kind of does today, you can add just a smidge of water and that will help to make it more workable. I'm not gonna do that right now because I'm not near a sink, but so I'll do the best I can with what I have. So you can see, I am trying to shape the clay into a teeny tiny little bowl. Like imagine you were trying to make a cereal bowl for a squirrel or something like that. So you want it to have some edges and you want it to have a, let me see if this is easier maybe. No, nope, not with my background. There we go. So you can see it has kind of like an indented area. Okay, so I'm gonna set that down here on my paper. And the next thing we wanna do is add some seeds. Now we've talked a lot about mon or milkweed seeds today because of the importance that milkweed plays in the monarch life cycle. As Cade said earlier, these monarch plants are critical for the monarch caterpillars. It's their only food source. And so, 
Um, that's why if you have the kit, we provided you with a mix of three different types of milkweed seeds. Now, if you are doing this at home with your own supplies, it doesn't have to be milkweed. You'll just want to pick a plant that pollinators like. There's lots of different flowering plants that I live in Ohio. I don't know where you all live, but there's lots of plants that are native, like originally grow in Ohio that attract pollinators, like the black eyed Susan and the purple cone flower that you saw in some of Cade's pictures. There's also things that we call host plants, and those are plants that caterpillars like. So we know milkweed is a host plant for monarchs, but you could also get things like parsley and fennel and dill and different types of butterflies will lay their eggs on those plants. I'm gonna pour some of these milkweed seeds in my hand. Let's see if I can get a good. So here's what they look like. I'm sorry if that's a little blurry. And you can see that there's different sized seeds. And you can also see that some of them are a little bit differently shaped or have different colors. And that's because this seed mix has three different types of milkweed in it. So I'm just gonna put a pinch of those in there. And there we go. Put the rest back in my packet. And then we want our seeds to have like a home within the seed ball so that as they, when they do start to grow, they have somewhere, um, somewhere where they can start having roots and their seedlings to be healthy. So I'm gonna put just a pinch of soil in there. And now what we want to do is to close it up. And last time I did this, I uh, didn't do a very good job. So if it takes you a couple of times to do this, don't feel bad. Um, but the first thing really is to try and pinch the edges of your clay shut so that it's gonna hold the seeds and the soil in. Because my clay got a little dry and I'm not going to take the time to get water right now. This might take me a little more time. And then I'm going to gently just kind of start squeezing because I want to form this back into a ball, like the ball that the clay was in before we started shaping it. Another comment in the chat, uh, someone has a ton of milkweed in their backyard, but they've never seen any monarch eggs or caterpillars on them. They have seen adult monarchs. Yeah, so as Kate mentioned, um, Monarch eggs are really small and they're very like they're white and they can be hard to spot when they are on the leaves. They're generally on the underside of the leaves. And I've noticed personally in my pollen, my butterfly garden at home, unfortunately, I've seen fewer uh, monarch caterpillars over the past year or two. Um, I'm I don't know why exactly. And maybe at the end we can ask Kate if he knows. But um, just keep watching. If you see adult monarchs visiting uh, your milkweed, they are likely laying eggs, although they can also get nectar from the flowers, uh, but it's just so hard to find those eggs sometimes. Okay, so I have mine here back into a ball. Unlike last time, I did not explode it everywhere, which is great. And then generally what we do is just roll that around in the soil again. And so this isn't a critical step, but it just adds a little bit extra, we call it substrate. That's just kind of a fancy word for a place for things to grow. Okay, so I'm just gonna kind of move that to the side. So now you might be wondering why in the world I gave you a square of fabric. It kind of looks like a bandana. And the reason I did that is because this is what we're going to package or to store our seed ball in until it's time to grow. So I'm just gonna take the seed ball and put it right there in the middle. And then I'm going to move my soil away so I don't spill it. Um, although my cat did steal my lid for it. So we'll see how that goes. Okay, so the seed ball is here in the middle of my fabric and just take the corners up and up. I would say you can have your seed ball packaged in there. And then in your kit, if you have that, you have like a piece of string with a label on it. If you're doing this at home with your own supplies, any piece of string or ribbon is a good choice. The reason I got this with the paper label on it is so you could write the type of seed that you have. So next time I'm close to a pin, I'm gonna write milkweed seeds here. Now, why did we put it in fabric? Why didn't we just put it in a Ziploc bag or something like that? And the reason for that is because if you put it into plastic, like a plastic container or something that's airtight that doesn't let the air flow around the clay, it won't dry out 
and that <laughs> because plastic is evil. I agree with that sentiment, but um, the reason for doing it for this is because we want the clay of the seed ball to dry out. And so it'll kind of form like a, a little bit of a protective crust around the seeds and the soil. Um, we don't want to leave it somewhere where it's going to sit and be moist because uh, moisture can cause the seeds to, um, to germinate. And let me turn off my phone camera. And now we can take the spotlight off of that one. Let's see. There we go. And um, I live in Ohio, as I mentioned earlier, and it's November, no, it's not November, it's October in Ohio, and it's a little bit too cold to start growing seeds right now. In fact, I won't be planting anything outside until we get to like April or May of the spring in 2023. And so I don't want my seeds within my seed ball to start germinating, to start growing until then. And so by having them dry out a little bit, it helps preserve them. During our program earlier in the week, we had someone ask about, can we put the seed ball in the fridge? And that is an awesome idea. And you might be thinking that seems kind of weird, but when you put seeds into your refrigerator, it gives them like kind of a cold, mostly dark place to live. And it kind of tells the seeds like, hey, this is winter time. It's not time to grow, it's time to sleep, so to speak. And so it keeps your seeds from starting to grow when you don't want them to. And then when you take your seeds out of the refrigerator and they um, are exposed to warmth and they're exposed to the you know, daytime sunlight and the nighttime darkness, they start to realize that it's time to start growing and that helps to spark them uh, to kind of initiate the growing process. So another reason why we picked this, picked this pretty fabric is because we're coming into a season where a lot of people might be celebrating different holidays and giving gifts and seed balls make a great gift. And by making it look nice and pretty, you've essentially just made an environmentally friendly gift that you can give to a friend or a family member um, the next time your family celebrates a holiday that includes gifts. So that is all that I wanted to present to you today, but we do have some time left. So if we can go ahead and add Cade to the spotlight. And if our folks from home are welcome to think of questions, you could ask us questions about how to grow plants for pollinators. You can ask Cade questions about his research, um, really anything that you want to know, but Cade, I'm gonna start the questions off by asking, I mentioned earlier that I have a butterfly garden at home and I've noticed that we've been seeing fewer monarch caterpillars on our plants at home. Have you been noticing that with your research lately? Um, yes and no. So monarchs have been having a bit of a rough year this year in particular. Um, we can tell that because there's a, an annual survey in the winter that looks at their um, wintering habitat in Mexico um, and just basically tries to get like a rough estimate of how many there are. And the fewer there are over the winter, the less, like the fewer we're likely to see the following summer. And this past winter, there weren't as many as there were a couple of years ago. Um, and in an overall trend, monarch populations are declining. They're actually just this year added to the endangered species list, um, which is unfortunate that they need to be, but it's good that they get that designation so that they can get the uh, legal protections that they need. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely something that pretty much everyone is noticing fewer and fewer monarchs, especially, yeah, for me this year, my, my research sites had definitely fewer than last year. Well, hopefully that's something that we see changing in the coming years. So just a reminder for those who may want to ask a question, you're welcome to type it into the chat. But also, if you'd just like to say your question out loud, if you could raise, use the raise hand feature, which if you go to the reaction part um, at the bottom of your screen, you should be able to raise your hand and then um, we can invite you to, to unmute yourself and you can ask your question to Kate or I uh, yourself. While you're thinking of questions, one of the questions that uh, 
And one of the things we talked about when we did this program earlier this week was um, the amount of seeds or eggs that a monarch lays versus the amount that actually hacked into adult butterflies. And I think we were talking about 10% of the eggs that are laid actually go through the whole life cycle and survive to be an adult butterfly. Is that right, Cade? Yeah, yeah, that is correct. Um, through various things like uh, insect predation, some things will, some other insects will eat monarch caterpillars or lay their eggs on them, which isn't good for the caterpillars. Um, yeah, only about 10% of those caterpillars actually make it to become butterflies. That's why every little thing that you can do at home to help support pollinators, butterflies and others is really important. And I do see a question in the chat, Cade, and this is from Mallory, and they want to know, the question is, do any Ohio species like marigolds? And I think uh, we can focus that in on any Ohio pollinator species that you know of like marigolds. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm honestly not sure specifically if any like marigolds over other flowers, but they definitely like marigolds. Um, they're a flower, they'll provide nectar. Um, so those are definitely good ones to plant. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure specifically about any of them. Yeah, I don't know either. I always plant marigolds with my tomatoes because I think there's some sort of like they are good to plant together. They help to keep some of the pesky insects away from your tomatoes and other uh, vegetable plants. But I don't really know anything about pollinators and marigolds. All right, keeping an eye on the chat to see if there's any other questions coming in. Please don't be shy. So Cade, can you tell us a little bit? So Cade is a student at The Ohio State University. Um, getting his bachelor's of science. Is that correct, Cade? Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about some of the things that you study and what kind of work that you hope to do after you graduate from Ohio State? Yeah, definitely. So I study uh, environmental science, um, which is basically anything relating to sustainability or uh, the environment, ecosystems, forests, um, water quality, and streams, and stuff like that. Um, I cover all of that. It's a it's a fairly broad major, which I like about it. Um, and I specialize in wildlife science, so um, a lot of birds and mammals and insects. My research, uh, as I mentioned, focuses on monarchs um, because I love those. And um, yeah, I, I would love to, when I graduate, keep working on uh, research in pollinators or, or any other wildlife, really. Um, it's my ultimate goal. I will go to grad school for that as well so that I can uh, get some good research jobs doing that. Awesome. Thanks for that. And I'm going to do one more question because our audience is quiet, but I'd happily take an audience question. So when we were talking earlier this week, someone asked you, like why monarchs? Like what made you so interested in studying monarchs? And you told us a story about that. Can you share that again today? Of course. Yeah. So um, I uh, first got, I guess, introduced to monarchs when I was seven years old and my neighbor brought me a, uh, a monarch caterpillar and said, hey, feed this milkweed and it will grow into a butterfly. And so I said, okay, <laughs> and I, I did, I fed it milkweed, I, I knew what milkweed looked like, so I went out, got some for it, and uh, I watched it turn into its chrysalis, which is the butterfly version of a cocoon, a cocoon is for moths, um, and then uh, hatch into a butterfly, and I just thought it was the coolest thing, I was just like completely fascinated by this whole process, and I started doing it every year, um, just going out, finding monarch caterpillars, monarch eggs, and it got me introduced to like other environmental issues like habitat loss, which is important for uh, monarchs and other pollinators. Um, pesticide use, which is uh, important, an important issue for them. Uh, and then even bigger things like climate change, deforestation, like global problems. Um, and that's why I ended up picking environmental science for my majors, because I have like that long interest in all of these environmental issues. Like I, I want to study this for my whole life, for my career. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that again. I've done that as well, where we've brought in caterpillars um, and given them a safe place indoors and fed them 
milkweed so that they can grow and eventually develop into adult butterflies. And I'm always amazed at how much a caterpillar can eat and how quickly they grow. So if you haven't experienced that yourself, it is something interesting to watch. Um, thank you everybody for attending today's program. Uh, we still have one last Westfest program today. Our last program is called Packing Oranges to Fix Errors, and it involves a bunch of bouncy balls if you have your um, Westfest kit or if you happen to have bouncy balls at home. Um, and you can still register at our event website, go.osu.edu slash Westfest. If you have any questions about the event, feel free to email us at westfest at osu.edu. Um, and that concludes today's program. So thank you for being here and we hope to see you in our last program. And if not, uh, we hope that you would join um, next year's Westfest. Thank you.